Well, hey, good morning, Calvary. How we doing? Uh, it's good to see you guys. I was away last week. Chris, great job last week, man. Just so blessed by your uh, gift of preaching, man. Just so grateful for you last week. Uh, if you have a copy of the scriptures, would you turn to Matthew chapter 25? Uh, this is our final week in our study of these parables this summer from the gospel of Matthew. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to miss hearing Paul Reed's booming voice on that video, hyping me up every uh, Sunday right before I get ready to preach. But uh, I, I, it's been a great journey to walk through the parables the last several weeks. Um, I do want to, I mean, just to kind of let you know where we're headed next week. I'm super excited about the new teaching series that's going to be starting next week. Um, you guys know that verse in Hebrews where it says, Since we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance that Christ has set out before us. Um, that, that line, the great cloud of witnesses, you know, I interpret that to mean all the saints that have gone before us, that have demonstrated what it means to live a life of faith. And so starting next week, and we're going to do it through the month of July, we're going to do a series called The Cloud, uh, referring to the cloud of witnesses. And each week, we're going to be looking at a different figure from church history and learning what their lives can teach us uh, about what it means to follow Jesus. And so next week, we're going to be looking at Charles Spurgeon, uh, at his life, and then we're going to have several other figures uh, throughout that series. And so uh, if you guys know me, you know I'm a church history nerd, so you're going to get to watch me nerd out for the next month, and so we'll do it all together. Um, but if you will, uh, would you uh, join uh, with Christians all around the world today as we pray the Lord's Prayer together? So pray with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, um, when uh, my family and I, when we used to live in New York City, um, I was involved in a running club. So, I mean, I love running. As you can tell, I don't lift weights. I run. That's what I do. Um, but running clubs are a really important part of the New York City social scene among young people. Everybody's involved in a running club. And so uh, that, uh, we had, on my team, we had a wide range of different types of people. And what this meant was there were a number of very impressive people uh, on our running club. Uh, celebrities that you would know the names of, CEOs, authors, journalists, famous runners. I mean, there were all sorts of people that were important, significant people. And so what would happen is at a lot of our practices, a lot of our team social functions, is you would see a whole lot of people fawning over these celebrities and tripping over themselves, trying to get in the presence of these very important people. And so you just saw a lot of that. People wanted to be around these important people. In contrast, I remember on our team, there was also a young man who had some developmental and social disabilities. And this young man, he wasn't a celebrity. He was just a guy with some disabilities. But he was so kind, and he always wanted to make friends so badly that he was always at practice. He was always at every team function. He would approach every person hoping that they would befriend him. But, you know, because of his developmental disabilities, he often misunderstood social cues. Um, and quite frankly, he was often awkward. And uh, I would always observe, okay? I would always pay attention. And I would notice that there were people who would ignore him. There are people that would dismiss him out of hand. There were people that were just flat out mean to him at times. There were people that were always doing the thing where they might give him some attention, but they're always looking over his shoulder, wondering if one of the more important people might be around the corner. And they're always hoping that they might, uh, that he might, they were, they're always afraid that he might ruin their chance of gaining the attention uh, of someone more important. And as most of you probably know by now, my son, who was sitting on the front row just a moment ago, has some significant developmental disabilities himself. And so it matters to me how people like this are treated. It matters deeply to me. And so I would take mental note of how people treated this young man. And it, I, I noticed the people who were kind toward him. I noticed people who were dismissive or cold toward him. And here's the thing I found out. How someone treats a celebrity or how someone treats a VIP tells you very little about their character. 
But how someone treats the disabled and the awkward and the outcast, that tells you everything about their character. And here's the thing. I know you're not supposed to do this, but I judged, okay? I judge people, right? Um, I found it hard personally to be friends with people who I saw be mean to this young man. On the other hand, when I saw someone be kind to this young man, they dignify him, encourage him, take photos of him. He always had his camera. He was always taking photos. Um, I said, when I saw people spending time with this young man, I said, those are my people. Those are the people I want to be around, the people that will love this man. Because, uh, the thing is, because my son has special needs, uh, my heart is intertwined with people with disabilities. It's just how it is. So what that means is when you're mean toward them, it feels like you're mean to my son, which feels like you're being mean to me. And I take it personally, right? And if you're kind toward them, it feels like you're kind toward me, and I take it personally. And I'll say this. Maybe this is harsh, but this is how I feel. You cannot be friends with me and mistreat my son or people like him, period. You can't. How you treat the disabled says a lot to me about the kind of person you are and the kind of person I want to be friends with. And you go, oh, that seems harsh. Well, buckle up. Jesus is about to be even harsher. In our passage today in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says that his heart is so linked with the needy and the vulnerable that when you show compassion toward them, you are directly showing compassion to Jesus himself. And likewise, Jesus says, when you ignore or mistreat the poor and the needy, Jesus says you are mistreating him. And Jesus says there's coming a day of judgment where all of us will stand before him. And on that day, he will determine whether you love and know him by how you treated the most vulnerable. Jesus will say you cannot be friends with him while mistreating and ignoring the vulnerable. This is what he says in this parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Says Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will then sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did, to, did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it also to me. And then he will say to those on his left, he'll say, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? He will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Those who have ears to hear, let us hear. So this is a parable about judgment. Jesus begins, he pulls no punches. <laughs> he begins, he says, the son of man will come in all of his glory. Now who's he referring to? He's referring to himself there. And he's saying, I will return and I will judge. And he's very direct in this moment about who he is. He's very direct about the type of authority he holds. And he's very direct about the type of judgment he will bring. He says, look, there's coming a day at the end of it all. I will return. And the word he uses is in glory. I'll be surrounded, he says, by angels. He will sit on a glorious throne. All nations will gather before him. He will establish his kingdom. And he and he alone will determine who are the sheep and who are the goats. And he will separate them. Some will go into his kingdom and some will be cast out forever. And on that day when we stand before him, there will be no more debates. There'll be no more lectures, no more votes about who Jesus is or what kind of kingdom he should establish. He will have the final say on that day. 
Because he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords, and he sits on a glorious throne. And to the sheep on that day, he will say, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. And to the goats, he will say, depart from me into eternal punishment. That's a hefty parable for today, huh? Now, I don't know about you, but I read this parable and it raises about 10,000 questions for me. And I'm not alone here because this parable has raised countless questions over the centuries uh, among Bible teachers and scholars. It raises questions like, well, who exactly does Jesus mean by the least of these? I mean, because he says in there, he says, it's these brothers of mine. And so people go, does that mean all the poor and needy? Or is that just poor Christians specifically? Is it the Jewish people? Is it referring to persecuted Christians? Is it referring to missionaries? People ask questions, who are the least of these? And then questions of like, well, where does this fit in the timeline of the end of the world? And listen, all of these are probably valid interpretive questions to ask. But when I read the Bible, especially the parables, I think it is most wise for us to take the simplest interpretation that the text gives us. And when I read this parable, and there's all kinds of questions I could ask, but at the end of the day, when I read this parable, here is what I see Jesus telling us. We will stand before him one day. And his question on that day for each of us will be this. Have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And have you loved your neighbor as yourself? And for those for whom the answer is yes, he will say, welcome home. And for those for whom the answer is no, he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, we ought to pay attention here to these words of Jesus. And I want us to look at the difference between the sheep the sheep and the goats. And the first thing we see from the sheep is that sheep serve others from a transformed heart. See, the king says to the sheep in this parable, he says, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Jesus says the sheep, the righteous, those who inherit the kingdom of heaven are those who cared for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. Martin of Tours, cool name, huh? Was a fourth century French bishop. And he was known for his care for the poor. The Catholic church sainted him because of his care for the poor. And his concern for the poor um, began when he was poor himself. He was a soldier coming home from battle. He had very little possessions, no money. And one day he was entering into the city and he came across a beggar who was begging. And Martin of Tours, he had no money to give, but he saw this beggar shivering in the cold and he was moved with compassion. And so he took off his coat and he gave this poor beggar his coat. And that night, shivering himself in his bed, he had a dream. And in his dream, Martin saw Jesus himself on his glorious throne, surrounded by angels, and he started looking closely, and he realized that Jesus, in his dream, was wearing his coat. And and one of the angels around the throne said to Jesus, said, Lord, why are you wearing that nasty old cloak? To which Jesus replied with a smile on his face, my servant Martin gave it to me. And this dream so moved Martin that he gave the rest of his life to serving the poor and the needy. See, Jesus says, what you did to the least of these, you've done unto me. And I just want to take a moment right now to just speak a blessing, speak encouragement over those of you in this room, those of you in our church who regularly and routinely serve the least of these in our church and in our community. So I just want to speak a blessing. May God bless those of you who are fostering or adopting kids in need. May God bless those of you who are working for or with nonprofits to serve kids and families. I think of Freedom Farms, Tuscaloosa Angels, Alabama Baptist Children's Home. May God bless those of you who serve every year with our Operation Christmas Child Ministry. May God bless those of you in our church who visit the sick and the needy in the hospital and those who are homebound. May God bless the men in our church who build ramps every week for the disabled all over our county. May God bless those of you in our church who pray and support and encourage our missionaries that we've scattered throughout the world. May God bless 
those of you who serve refugees and immigrants and international students in our church and in our community through ministries like ESL, English as Second Language, or International Connect. May God bless those of you who serve in our prisons. May God bless the team of people here at Calvary who every single Sunday meet my wife in the parking lot to help my son into the building and then sit with him and feed him snacks so that he can participate in worship with us. May God bless you. May God bless those of you who work with our multiple abilities choir, our choir made up of people with disabilities. May God bless those of you in this room who none of us will ever know it, but you are quietly paying the bills or providing services or care for church members in need. May God bless each and every one of you and may his face shine upon you. Jesus says that every act of kindness that you do for the vulnerable He says you're doing it to him directly, and so be blessed because you are. Let me ask you, though, as we see the sheep in this passage, why did they do it? Why do they serve the poor and the vulnerable? And the answer is because they were transformed by the grace of God. And transformed people live transformed lives. These weren't, the sheep were not calculating These weren't people trying to earn salvation. These weren't people trying to impress others or even impress Jesus. They're simply doing the things that came naturally to them. Transformed people naturally live transformed lives. And what's interesting to me, the most interesting thing to me about this passage is that the sheep are shocked when Jesus says to them, when I was in need, you served me. They go, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? I I don't remember serving you. They were surprised. When? When? When did we serve you, Jesus? They weren't even aware of the good deeds they had done in Jesus' presence. And Jesus said, listen, everything you did for the poor and the needy, you did unto me. And this is how I know this passage is not teaching a works-based salvation. See, on first blush, you read this passage and you go, well, it sure seems to me like entrance into the kingdom of heaven is determined by how you treat the poor. If you treat the poor well, you're saved. If you treat the poor badly, you're not saved. But the scriptures repeatedly tell us, how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith, not by works. Because if we were saved by works, we'd all be boasting and bragging about it. What the surprise of the sheep reveals to me that they weren't trying to earn their salvation. They didn't even know Jesus was paying attention. They didn't know that salvation was at stake there. They served the poor because their hearts had already been transformed by God. See, the sheep didn't serve to get saved. They served because they had been saved. 1 John 4, 19 says this, We love not because not so that he can love us, but we love because he first loved us. His love comes first. Overflow of, our, of his love toward us, overflow toward others comes next. Jesus said, or for John says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Listen, we are not saved by our good works, but our good works do reveal whether or not we're saved. And as we, look, as we move on to the goats, I would put it another way like this. Love for the outcast doesn't save you, but lack of love for the outcast definitely ought to concern you. If there's no fruit in your life toward the poor and the vulnerable there ought to be concern in your heart. See, the goats, the sheep serve from a transformed mindset. The goats, however, serve from a transactional mindset. I mentioned that the sheep were surprised at the judgment. They said, well, Jesus, when, when, did we, when did we serve you? We don't remember that. But the goats were surprised as well. Listen to this. Jesus says to the goats, For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit to me. And what is the goats' response? They're shocked. When did we ignore you, Jesus? When, when did we ignore you? And Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And the way the goats respond... Sure seems to me like they were saying to Jesus, well, why didn't you tell us that's what you wanted? Well, if we'd have known that all, you, all we needed to do was enter into the kingdom of heaven was just serve the poor, we'd have done it. If we'd have known that to get into heaven, we just had to be nice to people, boy, nobody told us the rules. See, it was transactional for them. If we would have known the price of admission, we would have paid it. 
But here's the thing I want you to see, church. Jesus is not after your transactional obedience. He wants to transform your heart. Jesus says that works done in an attempt to impress God or others, that's not real love for the poor and the vulnerable. That's love for oneself wrapped in the facade of caring for others. Charles Spurgeon told a parable of his own. He said, once upon a time, there was a king who ruled over everything in the land. And one day there was a gardener who loved the king. And one day he grew an enormous carrot, an enormous carrot. And it was the best carrot he'd ever grown. It looked beautiful and it was orange and it was bright and it was, looked like it would taste good. And he took that carrot to the king because he loved the king and he honored the king. And he said, my Lord, this is the greatest carrot I've ever grown or ever will grow. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you as my king. And the king was touched, and he discerned the man's heart. And so as he turned to go, the king said, Wait, you're clearly a good steward of the earth. I want to give you a plot of land. I want to give it to you freely as a gift so that you can garden the whole thing. And the gardener was amazed, and he was delighted, and he went home rejoicing at this incredible gift that the king had given him. Well... As this was happening, there was a nobleman in the king's court. He overheard this entire exchange. And he said, my, my, my. If that's what you get for a carrot, oh, man, what if you give the king something better? And so the next day, the nobleman comes up, chest puffed out, and he's carrying with him, he's leading a handsome black stallion. And he bows low, and he says, my lord, I breed horses And this is the greatest horse I've ever bred or ever will. Therefore, my Lord, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. And the king discerned his heart and he said, thank you for this beautiful horse. You're dismissed. And the guy walks away. He says, now wait a second. He said, wait a second. The other guy gave you a carrot and you gave him a plot of land. I give you a big old horse and you give me nothing. What's going on? And the king said to the nobleman, he said, let me explain, young man. That gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. See, that's the transactional mindset. If I do these things, God will owe me. If I do this, God must give me that. If I act this way, then God will be in my debt. God, don't have you seen all the good things I've done? Have you seen all the great things that I've been up to? Therefore, you've got to give me all the great things you have. But Jesus tells us over and over and over again throughout the Gospels, he is not after transactional obedience. He wants to transform your heart. And therein lies the difference between the sheep and the goats. The difference is motivation. The sheep is motivated by what God has already done for them. And that overflows into love for others. The goat, however, is motivated by their own selfish desires. The king, it says, will answer the sheep. Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So in this parable, this parable may teach us a whole lot of things. I'm sure it does. But at its very core, I believe this parable teaches us about how we are transformed by the grace of God. See, the sheep that are these transformed sheep, the righteous, they visit the hungry, they visit the thirsty, they visit the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. But why do they do this? Because God has first done it for them. See, the king in this parable, it's obvious, it's Jesus. The judge in this parable, it's obvious, it's Jesus. And when we think of kings and judges, we think of people off distant somewhere, don't we? But that's not the kind of king or judge that Jesus is. Jesus is a king that comes near. Jesus, uh, who has been with the Father for all of eternity, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Jesus left the throne of heaven, and he came to us. And what did he find when he found us? We were hungry. And what did he give us? He said, I am the bread of life, and he gave us the food of his broken body. He came and he found us, and we were thirsty. And he said, I'm the living water. And he poured out the wine of his blood so that we would never thirst again. He came and he found us naked and he clothed us, the scriptures say, with the robes of his righteousness. He came and he found us sick with sin and he laid down his life on the cross to heal us. 
He came and He found us imprisoned by our guilt and our shame. And He loosened and unlocked our chains and He set us free. And He did all of this out of His mercy and out of His kindness and out of His grace. Not because we deserved it, but because He's good and because He's kind. And when you have received this grace, it ought to transform your heart from the inside out. And that grace in your heart ought to overflow from your heart into works of justice and kindness and mercy and righteousness. Not as means to earn God's salvation, but as ways to demonstrate what God has already done for you in Christ. I heard one teacher say, it's not that the sheep in the parable recognize Jesus in the least of these. It's that they recognize themselves. When you come across the least of these, you ought to see yourself. You were hungry, and Jesus fed you. You were naked, and Jesus clothed you. You were sick, and Jesus has healed you. You were a prisoner of your own sin and shame and guilt, and Jesus has set you free. See, this is the good news of the gospel for anyone who has ears to hear. That Jesus has come, he has served you, the poor and the vulnerable and the needy, when you least deserved it. And as because he has served you, gratitude wells up and you are now motivated to serve others. Listen, we're not saved by good works. But if you've been saved by Jesus, good works flow naturally. They ought to. I want to take a moment. I want to invite our deacons forward. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. And I think this passage just leads into the Lord's Supper so well because I think of Jesus says he's the bread of life. When we were hungry, he came and he, his body was broken so that we could be fed. The scriptures say that we were thirsty. I think of the woman at the well. And yet he came. He's the living water. And he gave us something to drink. And what has he given us? To feed us, he's given his, us his broken body, which as we consume, we are made whole. And he's given us his poured out blood, which as we drink, we are, our sins are forgiven. And so today, as we take communion, I want this to be an opportunity for us to remember the grace that God has shown us in Christ. His body was broken and his blood was poured out so that you and I could be made whole. And as we take the bread and the cup today, I want us to take a moment to let it sit within us. I want us to, each of you, to, to, to take in the grace of God. But then as we leave this place today, we take the grace of God with us to the world around us. So would you please pray with me as I pray over the Lord's Supper for us. Lord, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for these parables that you have given us, these perplexing ways that you teach us about your truth. And God, I pray that we would have ears to hear. And Lord, as we take the bread and the cup in just a moment, I pray that we use this as an opportunity to remember the love you have shown us on the cross and the power that you've given us through your resurrection. And God, as we reflect on what you've done for us, God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred to do great things for others and for your glory. And so, God, I pray over these elements for the body and the blood, the bread and the cup. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.